Good evening. Uh, my name is Karen McAvoy. I'm the Professor of Law and Transitional Justice, and I'm based part-time in the law school and part-time in the Senator George J. Mitchell Institute for Global Peace, Security and Justice. And before I uh, start off, um, would you mind um, just on the tele on the phones thing, do put your phones to silent, please, because I gave a very stern lecture to a group of students um, about a week ago, and I was really looking pretty mean and evil at them all, and then my own went off, <laughs> and my daughter has put um, the Match of the Day uh, soundtrack to it, so it's sort of, someone impeded me. So anyway, um, if you wouldn't mind, just at least, at the very least, put it for sound. Um, so uh, by way of background, the Mitchell Institute, I think most of you will be familiar with it, but um, we are an interdisciplinary centre here at Queen's. Um, our, we were set up to bring together the many strengths in the university, working across different departments in sociology, lawyers, anthropologists, political scientists, cyber security experts, um, and then our modern languages, and right across the university, we all recognised that we had strengths um, in these different departments, but that in some ways we were all working in silos. So the Mitchell Institute, in effect, was, was created to, to bring us all together to do a number of things. First of all, of course, um, to produce high quality scholarship. Secondly, to teach and mentor our students, but also to try to make a difference, what we call in the university world, to have an impact in the real world. And the focus of our impact is in, in, the, in the context of conflict transformation, in, in effect, trying to help um, people involved in, in peace building using our research skills and expertise um, with all that. And I should also say, you know, those of us who we work here, you know, we, we live here, we, many, some of us are raising families here, all of us feel a very strong moral and political impetus to try to make a difference, to, to try to make this society um, better. And the lecture tonight is part of the broader university's policy engagement lecture series. That series is designed to provide a platform for meaningful discussion, engaged debate and open dialogue on a range of today's most pressing issues. It's a practical expression of the university's commitment, which is in our social charter, to engage in civic conversations. And one of our jobs at Queen's, is, and it's one that we take very seriously, is to, is to try to create a safe space, a secure space to have sometimes difficult and challenging conversations, but to do it in a, in a respectful fashion, and I know you'll, you'll all honour that tonight. Um, previous speakers in the lecture series um, have included the Tonistia, um, Simon Coveney, and we've had MPs, Conor McGinn, Dominic Grieve, also Laura Donis. We've had a number of the party political leaders, including Michelle O'Neill and Robin Swan. We've had the journalist Fintan O'Toole and others, and tonight we have the Chief Constable. Um, so, by way of background, um, uh, George's career as a police officer began in 1985 um, when he joined the Royal Ulster Constabulary. Um, since then, he's gained a wide range of experience in a variety of operational roles. 2009, he was appointed as Assistant Chief Constable in Strathclyde Police in Scotland, where he had responsibility for serious and organised crime, public protection and counter-terrorism. Prior to his appointment in Strathclyde, he'd been Chief Superintendent and District Commander in Beast. B District, which is south and east Belfast, and he also serves as a Detective Chief Inspector and Detective Superintendent in the PSNI. George holds a BA in Politics and Economics and a Master's in Business Administration. Obviously, that background in politics was of no use to you whatsoever in the PSNI. You know. um, he's a member of the Institute of Directors and the FBI Law Enforcement Executive Leadership Association. 2015, he was awarded the Queen's Police Medal um, in Her Majesty's uh, Birthdays Honour List. And tonight, the focus of his talk, which he tells me is going to be about an hour and 50 odd minutes. No, it's not. It's 25, 25 to 30 minutes, he says, and then we'll go to um, questions. So the focus of the talk tonight is reflections of policing, of policing with the community, people, partnership and public confidence. Ladies and gentlemen, Chief Constable. <laughs> Well, thank you. Uh, it is an honour to be here at Queen's this evening, um, and I'm grateful for this opportunity, and thank you, Kieran, for those kind words of introduction. It's a bit of a challenge for me tonight, because when I took time to consider what I might say here this evening, as I enter my last two months as a police officer, um, it wasn't straightforward. I felt almost at a loss, overwhelmed as to how I could reflect the myriad of thoughts, emotions and experiences in a way that might actually help signpost the next steps for policing, for peace building, uh, for our communities. So forgive me if I sound like I'm rambling, but there's just so much in here and I'm trying to get out in a sort of a structured way. But it was 1985 um, when I started in policing. A very different time to where we are now. I became a police officer because I genuinely, this might sound twee, but I genuinely wanted to make a difference. But I very quickly realised uh, that my desire was hampered 
by many factors, including politics, perceptions, prejudice, and all of that in the context of the ongoing conflict that was raging pretty heavy still in the mid-80s. And those obstacles were all pervasive for me at an individual level. In my assessment, they certainly were impacting negatively on the organization that I had joined and impacting negatively in society in the various communities that make up this place. So I suppose to be positive and optimistic as I stand here over 30 years later as Chief Constable, brackets, I never thought I would be doing that or saying that as Chief Constable, but I am and it's been a, it's been a great journey and an exhilarating one. But I stand here and I think, and hopefully you'd agree with me, uh, even if you disagree with other elements of what I'm going to say tonight, that the situation has been significantly transformed and for the better. Both policing and the community and the communities have been on a remarkable journey. And has that journey been completed? Well, of course it hasn't. I think it's clear to all that it's far from complete. But my experiences as a police officer on that journey have been both painful and pleasant. At times I've felt part of progress. At other times I have felt like we, I, have been stuck, even pulled or pulling backwards. Overwhelmingly, however, I feel a great sense of pride in what policing and communities have achieved together. We have invested so much and we have come so far, but we would be foolhardy to think that more change is not needed. So this evening, I want to add just my thoughts on our journey, where we've been to get to this point, and what our experiences might mean for the future. As in all transformational processes, there will be things that worked and we can be pleased about, we can even be proud of, but there will also be things that have not turned out quite how we expected. And there will be other things that simply need revisited or restarted. Since 2001, the transformation and placing has been scrutinized closely by local, national, international observers and accountability regimes. In recent years, a report to the United Nations by one of their special rapporteurs, Pablo de Creef, observed that of all the different elements of the peace process in Northern Ireland, the area in which the most progress has been achieved is the transformation of placing. Now, I have served sort of half of my um, half of my police service in the RUC and the other half in PSNI, with three years out when I was in the RUC for a dalliance into England, which is lovely, and in the PSNI, three years out for a dalliance into Scotland. So, but during that journey, and actually taking time out to look from afar and then to come back, has enabled me, I think, to have a unique to me experience or observation of what transformation has actually undergone in policing, especially when I see it and compare it with uh, other neighbouring jurisdictions. As an RUC officer, my desire was to keep people safe, and it was no less in the RUC than in the PSNI, having that simple values-based purpose to keep people safe. But I and I believe the vast majority of colleagues that I have served with in both organisations recognised that policing had to change if we were to gain support across all of our communities. The patent change process was about much more than a change in name or uniform. Important though that was in terms of symbols, but it was also about changes in structures and processes and most importantly it was about changes in culture and emotion. That was the difficult stuff. That is the difficult stuff. Cultural transformation does not happen immediately. It takes time, it takes courage and resilience. 
A key success of the transformation process, I think, has been the way in which accountability and human rights have been built into the foundations, into the DNA of the police service of Northern Ireland. I believe modifying for the better how policing thinks, what makes it tick, and how it acts. In addition to this, the mechanisms provided by the Northern Ireland Policing Board and the Office of the Police Ombudsman have been essential to building trust and confidence in policing. I was deeply frustrated during the past two years uh, when the policing board was not constituted due to the collapse of the Stormont institutions. I advocated strongly for the return of the board and I welcomed its reconstitution at the end of last year. And I do appreciate the attendance tonight of my chair, Anne Conley. So what I would be the first to say that the policing journey is not yet complete. I can also say with confidence that policing has undergone a remarkable transformation and for the most part, for the better. Over the last 10 years, we have overseen an almost 10% reduction in crime. That's despite over £150 million being taken out of the police budget in common with other public services due to austerity. That's 150 million just in my tenure in the last five years. In addition, independent surveys, not commissioned, not conducted by the police service, but independently through the DOJ, through the policing board, through others, are showing that uh, confidence in policing across the board continues to rise and is currently sitting at 86%. Now, I know, and I'll be happy to respond to it in questions, that there will be pockets, there will be corners of communities, there will be neighbourhoods where we have a massive job of work to do and the confidence levels would not feel like 86% in those communities. But I'm talking across the piece on statistically reliable research and survey conducted independently of us, we're sitting at 86% with £150 million out of the budget and a 10% reduction in crime. And in addition to that, uh, and I, we have a way to go on this as well, but we are more diverse and more representative than we have ever been, but still a huge way to go. And also complaints against the police at their lowest level in our history. So policing is, in my view, and I would say this, wouldn't I, but I believe it's a noble profession. It's also a difficult one. Powers to stop people on the street, to search them, to remove a fellow citizen's liberty from them are powers that no police officer should ever take lightly. At times, it's uncomfortable. The statutory duties placed upon us require us to take difficult and unpopular decisions. But we don't actually have a choice of simply ignoring an issue because it's too unpleasant too difficult, will result in bad publicity, will result in a hard time at the policing board. No, we must go where the evidence takes us. We must act with integrity. In doing so, it's right and proper that the checks and balances are in place so that we are held to account for our actions through the courts, through the policing board uh, and through the police ombudsman. Furthermore, it's not just accountability that gives confidence, it's actually good quality policing. Good policing with communities, policing with communities, builds confidence, credibility and legitimacy. Policing with the community, you see, buys us the licence to operate in challenging and difficult circumstances. So when we do that stuff that is unpopular, that is unpleasant, that doesn't quite feel right, but it's going where the evidence takes us, if we have done community policing well, it gives us the credibility, it gives us the license to operate in those challenging circumstances. At the last public meeting of the policing board, my senior team and I had to answer questions on a broad range of policing challenges that actually matter to our communities. These included, amongst other issues, the police investigation and response, the initial response into the horrific tragedy at the Greenville Hotel in Kickstown. We were getting challenged about our response to not being able to catch these ATM thieves. 
the caseload of our legacy investigations branch, the disclosure machinery that we had to service civil litigation, legacy inquests, criminal investigations, and all the rest of it. And on top of that, the management of the police budget and questions about why overtime was so high. I have always felt what I would describe as a healthy sense of nervousness as I go to the policing board. It can be challenging, but the ability to be able to have a discussion, a meaningful discussion about policing in such an open and transparent arena can only be beneficial for the organisation that I lead. There is no doubt in my mind that whilst I hold operational responsibility for policing, the board on behalf of the community not only holds me to account, important though that is, but also informs, advises, challenges and contributes to placing decisions in a real and meaningful way. And if, as cops, you can get over yourself, that is a really healthy source of challenge and of enablement around good decision making. It therefore seems incredible to me that for two of the five years of my tenure as chief, I didn't have a formally constituted policing board, although with what was left with the chair and the independents and the officials, we continued to act as if it was there, but actually that was on the basis of goodwill and determination on all of our parts. That an institution so critical to policing could be so vulnerable to political turmoil is one aspect of our journey I think that needs re-examined afresh. That accountability deficit should never be brought back to bear on policing when the politics collapses. So far from being an impediment, I believe accountability is an enabler of good, effective policing, even though at times it's extremely uncomfortable. Policing in itself is a human endeavour, and as in every human endeavour, mistakes and failings are inevitable. When they occur, the only way to, that we will retain the public's trust is if we're ready to acknowledge our shortcomings and to learn the lessons from the failings. I think PSNI has demonstrated our readiness, our willingness to do so through the robust accountability mechanisms of the policing board and the police ombudsman and the multiplicity of other inspection agencies who examine our actions, as well as, for the most part, a willingness to be accountable to communities through the media and through local engagement. There is, however, sometimes I think a need for reflection and recalibration on accountability. There's a balance to strike between good and effective accountability and a level of irresponsible, reactive and ill-informed commentary that can become corrosive and destabilizing. I'm not being defensive, but in my view at times that balance has been lost and the journey that policing and society have been on have suffered as a result. Supporting good, effective accountability and supporting the delivery, the delivery of effective policing comes with a level of responsibility that sometimes has been lacking. Across the political spectrum, those who, sh who should bear responsibility for supporting further progress have sometimes defaulted to the blame game. They have retreated into their respective political bunkers when it suits them, finding it easier to blame the police without taking any responsibility for the context in which their police service is being asked to operate. Legacy is a clear example of this. Legacy has been a challenge on which Patton's new beginning to policing has continued to stall. The impact on public confidence is immeasurable. In the first speech, the first uh, speech that I gave as Chief Constable, I warned that policing and indeed our peace process risked being dragged backwards unless a societal political resolution was found to dealing with the past. Throughout my tenure, I have explained 
publicly and privately, time and time again, to anybody that will listen. The PSNI is neither resourced nor equipped to deal with the past. So you should not be surprised when we drop the ball, and that's not an excuse or defensiveness. It's the reality that we have warned of. I welcome the proposals made in the Stormont House Agreement and offer to give all of the PSNI legacy data to the proposed Independent Historical Investigations Unit, allowing us to concentrate on keeping people safe today and into the future. I'm now in my final two months as a police officer, and there is still little sign of progress. I therefore find it disappointing that politicians from all parties give me tea and sympathy in private on this matter, but in public talk of our failures in dealing with legacy and how this has created things like rock-bottom confidence in policing or partisan policing by only pursuing state actors rather than the terrorists who inflicted the most pain. That's not effective accountability. That's point scoring. That's shifting the blame. What policing needs on this issue is political honesty and political leadership to bring about solutions to fix the problem. Families need that honesty and that leadership too. I think it's a damning indictment that in the ongoing political vacuum, members of grieving families are passing away without any resolution, without justice and without answers. Another area for our transformation that needs renewed and constructive accountability is community representativeness within the police service. For a police service anywhere to have the confidence of the community, it must be representative of that community. While the police service today is much more representative of the community than the one I joined in 1985, but like all other police services, we still have lots of work to do in this regard. We remain underrepresented among a number of groups, including young people, women, members of the Catholic Nationalist Republican community, members of loyalist working class areas, and people living west of the ban. Worryingly, our current forecasting shows that if recruitment continues as it is, and retirements continue as they are, our overall Catholic representation will decrease. I have expressed concern about this publicly and have asked for a rational, informed public discussion on the issue, ideally via our policing board. But our last recruitment campaign was overshadowed by a political debate and point scoring on the virtues, the advantages, the disadvantages of 50-50 recruitment. Again, I do not believe that such acrimonious debate provides effective accountability that supports real progress for all of us. It is my view that political point scoring occurs at the, expen at the expense of policing and our peace process. PS and I will continue, of course, to challenge itself as to what more we can do to improve representativeness, including options like direct entry into various levels of the organisation and various specialisms, apprenticeships and secondments, different ways of doing things. But the fact remains that the police service cannot do this in isolation. The bigger and more sustainable requirement is political and societal change. So bear with me, but I want to spend a few moments just talking about recent events and the scourge of paramilitarism and violent dissident republican activity and what we can perhaps see in that as we look to the future and to try to build a more positive uh, process. So the terrible events of the last few weeks expose an important stage in our collective ongoing journey. Thursday night, 18th of April, uh, bullets meant for police officers claimed the life of Lyra McKee, a young woman who championed inclusivity, murdered by young men who have been lost 
in the margins of our new beginning. Her killers are not just the young man who fired the gun and his accomplice who lifted the casings. Her killers are also those who supplied the gun and orchestrated the journey of those young men to the moment in which Lyra was murdered. In January this year, the same group were responsible for a car bomb that exploded outside the courthouse in Derry. A group of young people had walked past the car just minutes before. What if the bomb had exploded at that moment when those kids were walking past? Lyra's murder makes that what if question all the more real. Those who continue to believe in the use of violence do so in acceptance of the fact that they are risking the lives of their own communities. Their intended target may be police officers or prison officers, but their very actions place communities at risk. They do not care. In fact, they seem to embrace it as an expense of their cause. Among the consequences of each and every attack is the reality that a member of their own community could be killed or injured. Lyra's family, partner and friends are now living with that reality. Hiding behind masks and clandestine media interviews, those that carry out these attacks show cardus in a way that they, in the way they fail to make themselves accountable to their community. They have made it abundantly clear that the violence will continue despite their own admission that it is little community support. What if, what if instead of Lyra, the bullet had hit a police officer? For the very small number of people who think that such an outcome would have been okay, let me tell you a little bit about the police officers that were on the ground, standing beside Lyra that night, that administered first aid, that put her into a police vehicle, that confided her to hospital, hoping that she would survive. survive. They, like Lyra, have family, partners and friends that love them, that care for them. They are also sons and daughters, brothers and sisters, some of them mums and dads. Some of them grew up in the city, are citizens of the city and care for it. Lyra chose the noble profession of journalism and had excelled in her short life, contributing hugely to our community with her thought-provoking words and her incisive analysis. The police officers in Cregan on the night she was murdered had chosen the profession of policing. Their individual contributions to the community are less well known. One of the officers there, standing in the vicinity, who administered first aid, who took her to hospital, was also the first officer on the scene of the bomb outside the courthouse in January. Without a thought for his own safety, he began to evacuate people from the area. From the area. Windows exploded around him when the bomb exploded. Another of the officers there that night had saved the life of a man that day who was involved in a car crash in the city. Two others had helped save a life of a suicidal individual at the Foyle Bridge that day. Earlier this year, a number of officers who were there prevented serious harm when they searched and recovered guns in the city to help keep the city safe. Guns and blades at a graveyard in Park, just outside of Derry, while others have been involved in taking at least £200,000 worth of drugs off the streets. These are just a tiny snapshot of the many individual unknown stories of how police officers serve our community, police with the community, every day and every night. Since Lyra's murder, many powerful gestures have been made by a community that is tired of violence. Many powerful words have been spoken or written. Challenges have rightly been led at the feet of our political leaders, most recently and eloquently, of course, by Father Martin McGill, McGill at, uh, speaking at Lyra's funeral service. Those challenges 
have had resounding support across the community. And I believe, being the, optimism, being the optimist that I am, that those challenges have been heard. Today, of course, was the first day of cross-party talks. What action will unfold from that? We need to wait and see. But there must be no underestimation that a resolution to the outstanding issues is badly, badly needed. Before, long before Lyra was murdered, there was a sense that our peace process was stalling. Certainly the political process was stalling. In cold police statistical terms, there have been 150 security-related deaths since in the 21 years since the peace agreement. But behind each statistic is the devastation, grief, and pain of family and friends. There have been many more paramilitary-style assaults or punishment beatings, whatever label you want to attach to them, each one leaving not just broken bodies of victims, but the shattered minds and hearts and mental health problems of people all around them. Despite all the progress that we have made, paramilitaries still seek to exert coercive control on our communities, peddling a fantasy that they exist to protect or defend the community. These groups are mostly driven by their own self-interest. The Fresh Start Agreement was an opportunity to change all that. The agreement was a clear recognition that bringing an end to paramilitarism would never be achieved by policing working in isolation. That was old thinking. Through the Paramilitary Crime Task Force, of course, there is a role for the police service, and the PSNI is working hard to deliver on our responsibilities within the Fresh Start Action Plan or the Tackling Paramilitaries Action Plan, as it no longer feels much like a fresh start. But we need others to do the same. And we need a functioning executive uh, a functioning political leadership to help support and drive that delivery. A restored executive would have the opportunity, and I believe the community support, to take brave steps to reset our transformation agenda. Not just for policing, but for the wider uh, peace process. I believe the learning we have gained over the last 20 years should allow us to be more ambitious about what we can achieve. The same communities who suffer from the intimidation, abuse and serious harm caused by paramilitaries and organised crime are also vulnerable to social deprivation, to isolation. Uh, they suffer higher levels of drug and alcohol addiction, as well as educational underattainment. These communities are crying out for good, effective, community policing, and they should remain a priority for the police service in the future despite the ongoing serious uh, budgetary constraints. But it's not just policing that these communities want. They want the support from a more holistic and joined up public services, including health and education and job opportunities, uh, housing, infrastructure, as well as the crime and community safety issues. Before the political collapse, it stormed. there were some glimmers of light, of hope for us optimists that are still around. That light shone out of the draft programme for government, which for the first time in Northern Ireland brought forward the vision of real and effective partnership, working across public services to provide support to the most vulnerable in our communities and to deliver the best services in the most efficient way. We need the political leadership that brought that thinking to bear to get re-energised and re-engaged. Transformation is a constant aspect of life. Some aspects of transformational uh, change can be visible and powerfully felt, while other aspects can be slow and quiet and in our busy world almost happen unnoticed. Transformation can bring positive progress, but equally it can have negative impacts. Indeed, the same transformation can be experienced from one person to the next, from one community to the next, in very different ways. 
All of these aspects of transformation have been part of our journey to date. I said at the outset that the journey of policing and our community is not yet complete. Of course it's not. And the fact is it never will be complete because peace and progress requires constant nurturing and investment. Over the past 20 years, as a community and as a police service, we have invested so much. It will be the failure of our generation if we do not reinvigorate our efforts, re-energize our efforts, and invite the next generation to continue the transformation. We have overcome far greater challenges in the past. I know we can do the same again in the future. Communities and politicians working together with police have shown great leadership and taken great risks to bring peace. Do you remember the hope when the peace agreement was reached in 1998? Do you remember the optimism, the pragmatism, the compromise, to use a dirty word in some circles, the compromise from political leadership that restored the power-sharing executive 12 years ago tomorrow, on the 8th of May, uh, 2007. The politicians going into the current talks should reflect carefully. They should challenge themselves on the leadership and the work of their political predecessors over the past 21 years. I want to finish now, and I want to conclude by using the oft-quoted wise and eloquent words of Seamus Heaney in The Cure of Troy. History says, don't hope on this side of the grave, but then, once in a lifetime, the longed for tidal wave of justice can rise up and hope and history rhyme. So hope for a great sea change on the far side of revenge. Believe that a, current, that a further shore is reachable from here. Believe in miracles and cures and healing wells. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sir George. I don't have a, I don't have a phone or a watch, so will you keep me right for time? Also, how am I doing? What time is it at the moment? Okay. Um, so I'm going to open it up um, now for questions. George, would you like to take these questions singly, or do you want me to take them in twos and threes, whatever you prefer? Uh, let's see the complexity of the question, okay. shall we? <laughs> right. So it's open to you guys. Who wants to start us off? We have roving mics, I think, somewhere there. there should be one coming across to you now. There's a chap here in a green T-shirt in the centre there. If you just introduce yourself, and if you're representing an organisation, let us know who they are. I kind of want to be a police officer myself. Uh, with the evolution of counter-terrorism policing within the mainland, with the employment of counter-terrorism specialist firearms officers, is that model going to be employed within the PSNI in the near future to help combat counter-terrorism or help combat terrorism within the province? Um, well, I, I don't know is the question uh, because I can't really speak for the next chief constable. <laughs> But one of the freedoms that I get uh, as I approach retirement is I can say what I think of what I would do. And uh, I, I am all up for uh, direct entry into certain specialisms. But for me, things like uh, direct entry tactical firearms is much too narrow. I need people to understand, especially in this jurisdiction, I need them to understand community. I need them to understand the impact that our actions, especially around the use of any force, can have that will ripple way beyond the injury caused to a specific individual, even if the use of force is justified legally. The community impact, the symbolism, the, the ripple effect of that is something that I want people to be a police officer with a heart for communities first and then a firearms specialist second. So my own view, and I can't tie a future chief constable to this, um, but my own view is that direct entry and that degree of specialism for a career-long spell would not be conducive to the sort of policing that we're trying to uh, build here. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a question here and then in the centre. Hi, Chief Constable Morris Campbell. Thank you very much for that insight. Could I ask another resource-related question? 
Uh, and I have great admiration for your continued optimism after such a period of service through such troubled times. I'm concerned, however, that not everything always goes well. And I'm also concerned about the overall strength of the service and its establishment numbers. Uh, and to some extent, the lack of flexibility, you no longer have the full-time reserve, you no longer have a substantial part-time reserve. Uh, and we know there are difficulties in bringing offers and officers across from the mainland uh, on mutual assistance. If things don't go terribly well, if we do end up with a hard border, uh, if we end up with continued civil unrest or a res resumption of civil unrest, do you have the resources needed uh, to allow you to police this community? Well, um I have to answer that question as a responsible public servant. And, uh, you know, you can get away with saying more as you're walking out the door. I'm not going to do that because I, I do want to be responsible. That question is a, is a good one to fire my direction. But actually, I'm no different, really, in that regard to chief executive of a health trust or an education authority or other leaders of public services uh, in this jurisdiction. And I don't feel like we have been the poor relative in policing, that we've been shortchanged. Uh, in fairness, both the devolved departments, even without political leadership, have been hugely supportive, trying to uh, help policing as best it can. That said, I have never offered up one brown penny of a, of a reduction, but I, I do feel that when I engage with the permanent secretaries, with ministers when we had them, I got a sympathetic hearing, and sometimes that sympathy translates into additional help because of the unique circumstances that we face. Most recently, uh, there was a bid to Treasury um, around, I was going to try to get through tonight without mentioning the B word, Brexit, but um, there was a bid that we submitted to Treasury that was basically co-written by officials in the Department of Justice and my own people, and I didn't see that as compromising anybody's independence, it just was a sensible thing to do, along with support from NIO colleagues actually. But we navigated that through Whitehall to the Treasury and got the 16.5 million for this current financial year. No other bid across the UK was met in full by HMT. So I think that uh, there, are, there is an appreciation at a political and senior official level that policing does have unique challenges. And whilst I do feel, I suppose, stretched and challenged around trying to do more with less and all the rest of it and deal with people's expectations and continued service delivery, I, I do feel like we've had tangible support uh, around that. Um, I think uh, there, there are probably other options that would involve less money that uh, creative political leadership could make happen. It would require legislative uh, change, but there are things around, um, officially we are a non, the police service is a non-departmental public body. That means that you can't really raise your own revenue. You can do some minor cost recovery, but it's around the fringes, really. You can't do any revenue raising. You can't carry forward. And part of the revenue raising in other parts of the United Kingdom is precepting, where local authorities agree to put a couple of pence on uh, council tax to pay for policing services. Now, that's a far from perfect model, but it does give scope for revenue raising uh, for policing, should local politicians in an accountable manner wish to do that. So there's things like precepting, revenue raising, carry forward, building up reserves. Like, I can only build up reserves, but I have to use them or lose them within a financial year. And, you know, of course, I would like more money and we could use more people and we've got this constant struggle about the changing nature of policing demand, which takes us into like investigating cyber stuff, which you don't really do in the main street in a high visibility jacket, or dealing, because we're getting better knowledge of it, child sexual exploitation or serious sexual offending. A lot of that is done in a less visible, less public place. And at the same time, we know that to buy the license to operate, as the term I used in the speech, uh, we need to do good community policing. We need neighborhood policing teams out and engaged. So, You've got money going downwards, demand overall going up, um, although we're getting crime down, but safeguarding and other non-crime responsibilities are increasing uh, with the, the money going downwards. So actually, we need to find a different way of doing things so that we deal with public expectations and assurance and confidence, and at the same time, deal with a more technical, less visible uh, bucket of demand for policing.
Okay. Next question is uh, Katrina Centre Road. There, blonde haired lasses. Joanne. Um, you mentioned the paramilitary style punishment attacks, and obviously there's been a spike in those recently. You mentioned that it's a systemic change that's needed more broadly, but what do you think the police can do to assist with that? Well, um, I, I don't want to get into arguing about numbers, but actually if you look over the last 10 years, the number of paramilitary assaults is on a downward trajectory. Now, you only need three over a weekend to make it look and feel like a spike. So I'm not, I'm not arguing about your analysis, but I think the numbers will say that we're going in the right direction. One is one too many, however, so the numbers are almost irrelevant. I do think that um, there is something about um, the police being, making sure that we have as an efficient response possible. So we have started doing things now like reviewing our investigations, peer reviews into paramilitary uh, assaults at about 14 or 28 day stage, the same as we do with things like rape and homicide. If they're not solved within that first month, we bring in another team to pour over every detail. We have trained uh, our local people, our detectives, what they're looking for, making sure that every evidence is not, uh, that, that every evidential opportunity is fully exploited, making sure that we don't become guilty ourselves of the complacency or the ambivalence that I sometimes see in other parts of society within communities themselves. Don't mean to blame the communities, but sadly there is a bit of an acceptance that this is a fact of life. And actually if someone is misbehaving, guilty of antisocial behavior, peddling drugs without a license or whatever, that it's somehow legitimate for paramilitaries to break their legs or shoot their ankles. That is not legitimate and we should never give it any legitimacy and I think there probably isn't any advocacy for it out there, but I do believe that there sometimes has been an ambivalence. So I'm going to put that challenge to other civic leaders, even the communities themselves. We need to make sure that our approach to paramilitary style assaults is absolutely top drawer. I think another problem that we have is one of communications and positioning ourselves in this because um, there's no actual offence called under the Offences Against the Person Act or any other statute called a punishment bitten or a paramilitary style assault. It'll be things like grievous bodily harm or it'll be people arrested on their way to do the paramilitary assault. If we can get ahead of it through intelligence or sometimes good luck or a bit of both, um, if we can get ahead of it and we interdict people before they cause the harm, which we would always try to do just from a human rights perspective, um, they will probably, unless they start admitting things, which isn't that likely, they'll probably end up being charged with possession of an offensive weapon or possession of firearms in suspicious circumstances. Now, without prejudicing that person or proceedings at court, we need to find a way of sort of getting a big light to flash above those sort of cases where people understand that actually the police keep getting hammered on the, the number of detections for these paramilitary style assaults, but it isn't always as bad as it first appears because there are things that we can't connect beyond reasonable doubt, evidentially, to the paramilitary style assault, but we know from an intelligence and assessment perspective that we're having uh, more of an impact around disruption and interdiction. Okay. Next question is Joanne here, also in the centre in the row just in front. I'm conscious that a lot of the questions are coming from the centre ground, so if there's a hard left set of questions over here. <laughs> Joanne Murphy, uh, the Clinton Leadership Institute and Queen's Management School. Um, George, you've spoken a great deal about political leadership and the significance of political leadership and what it can do, but I suppose it would be interesting to hear from your experience as you, you move towards the end of your tenure as Chief Constable, which itself is a very significant leadership role in Northern Ireland, what your reflections are on leadership itself and I suppose your own leadership practice. Well, I think... Um we could we could do a whole session on that alone, um, but I think some of the some of the headlines for me um, are dealing with. I've talked a lot about transformation as well, um, and there is something about trying to change the organisation, either the operating model or the culture or processes or structure 
while still trying to maintain uh, service delivery. Uh, Drew Harris, my former deputy and now Commissioner of Angarda Shikana, describes it as trying to rebuild the, air, the aircraft whilst it's in flight, and that's exactly what it feels like at times. So you do need a certain flexibility and agility. There's also something connected with that that I have learned very quickly as Chief of um, if you wait for all the question, all, all the information that you need to answer the question or to deal with the dilemma, the question will probably have changed. There is something about navigating your way through ambiguity and a bit of chaos without complete information. And uh, therefore, you know, I've been through you know, all the leadership training that one could hope for, very well supported by the organization in my earlier years and all the rest of the, you know, sponsored it in an MBA and enjoyed all of that. And we've been through all these cycles of what is it, it's not the person with the biggest brain that makes the best leader, but there is something about, um, I have an old fashioned word that isn't really topical, you don't find it in all those management textbooks, but it's called wisdom. And I think it's like a combination of a bit of intelligence, like IQ, a big, big dollop of emotional intelligence, but it's also a bit about learning from experience. It's also a bit about acting with enough humility to know that you don't have all the answers. It's about building relationships with people up and down and across the organization that you know they're not going to tickle your ears, but they're going to give you honest feedback and tell you when they think you're about to mess up. And uh, all of that, I think, comes together rather than, you know, uh, rather than, than years done, it's miles travelled sort of stuff. How, how much experience, which is all part of this wisdom. And, and I think we need a, a little bit of a return to actually how you go about equipping people with that. And there's all the stuff about mentoring and coaching and, and so on. But there's something, and this is really difficult for policing because of the stringent accountability mechanisms. There is something about... Uh, Moving, be, uh, remaining accountable, but having a learning culture so that you can actually, you can be allowed to mess up uh, as long as it's not reckless and negligent and all of that. But there's something about making room for mistakes or making room for people, empowering them to make decisions. One thing that I've struggled with, frankly, at a very senior level is asking people to take responsibility for something and then they go away and they deal with it in a way that I necessarily wouldn't biting my tongue <laughs> and not changing it because you have the hierarchical authority to do it. But actually, you can't empower somebody to make a decision. And they make a decision that's quite ethical, it's within the rules, it's efficient, but it wouldn't be the one I would have chosen. Learning to live with that is, and I'm a big emotional fellow that wears his feelings on his cuff, so actually dealing with that for me is re really difficult. And that's quite tactical stuff, but I think with that sort of openness, it's about breeding leadership, and it's not just about exercising leadership yourself, but about empowering others to do it, and being the example, and being the role model, and having that sort of blend of self-belief and confidence, but also enough humility to balance that out. So I don't claim to have cracked all of that, by the way, but at least I know what I'm aspiring to. Okay, I've got quite a lot of hands up now, so I'm going to start taking these in bunches. So um, I'm going to take John Topping, glasses, moustache here in this row. He's a friend of mine, otherwise I wouldn't draw attention to his moustache. If you think, <laughs> think and, then, and then Dagmar, and then Yassin. Okay, so John. Okay, hi, so John Topping, I'm a criminologist here at Queen's and also chairperson of Community Restorative Justice Ireland. George, I had the, the great pleasure five years ago being at your very first public... Um, uh, meeting, which was at a joint uh, event between Northern Ireland Alternatives and CRJI. And I just wonder, my question is quite a direct one, do you feel uh, those community-based restorative justice organisations, and particularly in those hard-to-reach communities that you've talked about, do you think they deserve more recognition uh, for their role in keeping many of those communities safe, uh, uh, working very often uh, in parallel with PSNI? Okay, so that's CRJ question, Dagmar. Direction. My name is Dagmar Schick. I'm professor of European Union law, which also means I have no professional competence to speak about policing, but I have some experience in anti-discrimination law and policy in the HR perspective. And you were mentioning the direction of uh, professional development of your deputy 
to now work south of the border, which obviously was a very interesting and partly controversial movement. Do you think that perhaps movements in the other direction, so having of professional development, would perhaps contribute to changing policing in Northern Ireland? And also, are there any, how is the practice in cross-border policing? Just forgetting the B word for a moment. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Yasin, just a row in front, yeah. Um, thank you very much, Chief Constable. I'm Dr. Yasin Brunger, a lecturer in human rights here at the School of Law at Queen's. My question really relates to um, how we understand community in a changing uh, Northern Ireland. So with that, I wanted to ask you about your reflections in terms of community policing in relation to ethnic minority groups within Northern Ireland. As Kieran said, there are many people who have made Northern Ireland their home and are raising children here. And I think there is an important... Uh, you know, uh, consideration to be made there about building confidence with those communities who have come here and made Northern Ireland their home. And that, and I think there is a responsibility of the police service in, in doing that. So I wanted to really ask you, it's, it's a bit of a direct question, but in your tenure, what have you done in terms of supporting that and facilitating that engagement with communities, uh, ethnic minority communities? And then looking forward, what would you say your incumbent coming in, what advice would you give them about building confidence with those communities that um, shouldn't be forgotten and marginalized in our discussion of policing? Okay. Oh, three big questions. Oh. Uh, if I can remember them. Uh, uh, that last one was very challenging. It sounds like a job interview question. <laughs> Could be for the next but, job, you know. <laughs> um, well, first of all, you know, us engaging uh, with the North minority ethnic communities is important for us, not just from the point of view of, you know, uh, the hate crime elements and all of that, but actually we want the organisation to be representative. Uh, we want, uh, when I talked about, you know, good policing buys you the licence to operate, that piece around legitimacy, that is probably more important in, in smaller minority communities. Um, and we get that, and we recognise it. Um, so you know, we're, we're actively engaged around that. For example, uh, on Sunday coming, we will have an initiative in Belfast here called Kick Off at Three, where um, members of the Ethnic Minority Police Association uh, from Northern Ireland, uh, along with a network of their colleagues from throughout the UK, uh, will be running a football competition um, in Belfast to reach out to engage into young people from those uh, ethnic minority communities. And that, that is because we're trying to increase our outreach so that we're representative, so we've got community confidence. And actually we know, like with other minority groups, there is massive under-representation of crime, of victimisation, of harm that's ongoing there. So. This is something we take uh, seriously. It's been a priority for us, you know, one of three or four strategic priorities dealing with hate crime. And under that, we have got control measures about prevention and enforcement and gathering intelligence and reassuring people. And in our one with hate crime, a lot of the preventative and reassurance stuff is all about community engagement and reaching out into those communities. Uh, there's still a way to go, even you know around. We've got a very good relationship with the Ethnic Minorities Police Association. Um, they're quite challenging, you know. They come and see me a couple of times a year. We get involved in uh, joint engagements together. Uh, last year, we chaired in Belfast and Titanic the National Black Police Association conference. There's probably about 400 people at it. We want to be at the front in addressing all of the issues that that are more pertinent in minority communities. So it's a good question and we do take it seriously. And, and like a number of things that I've referred to tonight, we're not saying that there's not more that we could do. What I can say with confidence is there is an openness to doing that. So on the piece around um, bringing in different experiences from other places and potentially a chief constable being appointed externally. I want to say very little about that because I've criticised a certain politician for commenting too much on it while the, uh, the, while the appointment process is ongoing. What I would say is that I think it would be really helpful 
And this is not in any way to be negative about the caliber of the current senior executive team, because there are people that I feel honored to work with and highly competent and fully committed. But I know from my own experience of going to Scotland for three years as an assistant chief constable, I took you know, a, a generation of policing experience in a slightly different operating environment with different and perhaps higher levels of risk, certainly around terrorism and community engagement and all of that, to Scotland with me. And I think the feedback was that I made a positive contribution. But coming back three years later, I brought a whole new perspective back into PSNI. Now, that was almost 10 years ago or whatever, eight years ago. So it's all a bit stale and not so creative and not so new anymore. But that experience of people going out and coming back, or just new people coming in, especially at, uh, not even just around senior posts, though it is significant there, but uh, throughout the organization, to bring in different thinking, even just around creativity and innovation, is really healthy. And you know, whilst we're very happy with our homegrown talent, I would love to see other people benefit from that by more of us going. And I would like to see some challenge and critical thinking to our own way of doing things by having different thinking coming in. Um, so I think it's a, it's a good point, uh, well made. And um, I think certainly for senior appointments, it's the policing board that are responsible for those. But I know the chair and I have written to lots of chief officer and qualified people looking for jobs, encouraging as representative a, a pool as possible into not just the current application, but across all uh, chief officer posts. So that's a good point. Um, so John's question then. Oh, see our, yeah, yeah, so yeah. Really sort of justice. Um, could we do more? Well, we could always do more. I'm a big advocate for restorative practice, including restorative justice. Uh, and I say that not just because it sort of feels nice, but actually the all, well, you would know this better than me. There's no point in quoting stats to you, but, but for, for, for other people in the audience, you know, there's higher victim satisfaction rates when you have a restorative outcome. The offender is less likely to re-offend. There is less costs for the criminal justice system. There is less population in prison, and it just makes so much sense. I think our approach to it is a little bit piecemeal. I worry that uh, it, the levels of advocacy across various organisations differ. Um, I know that as, as PSNI's uh, financial belt has tightened, any flexibility there would have been for us to fund some really high-end quality voluntary third sector organisations like Restorative Justice Ireland, like Northern Ireland Alternatives, like Women's Aid, like you know, community search and rescue facilities. There's a number of voluntary and third sector uh, services that are provided and there's a real risk to them um, uh, because of funding. And, and I think there needs to be a way of allowing those organisations to remain in their voluntary and community space and not become public sector organisations, but at the same time finding some mechanism, an accountable value for money way that means that their organisations and their futures is more sustainable. Uh, and I was advocating heavily for your organisation and alternatives when we had a justice minister, but uh, I can just sort of talk to senior officials now who all agree with me, but of course those are quite political decisions to be taken around uh, funding. And I say that recognising the money would need to come from somewhere, but actually for the greater good and for uh, the outcomes-based approach that the, program for the draft programme for government referred to, all, all of this just makes sense. There's an evidence base to it and we know that it works. Just by way of context as well, for some people who may not be aware, the organisations that we're talking about here um, emerged from direct dialogue with Republican and Loyalist paramilitaries um, challenging cultures of violence in local communities and would include prominent ex-combatants amongst them. And so the fact that they have created very effective working partnerships with the PSNI in both Republican and Loyalist communities from, from our perspective as a, a you know, Mitchell Institute, it's a very interesting model um, in terms of challenging cultures of violence in local communities. So, Hastings, you had your hand up there, yes? And I see one, two more, and I think that's going to be it. Yes, so I'm going to take this one, this one, and yourself over there. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. 
Uh, a few moments ago, you had a question from the director of the Clinton Institute, my colleague sitting just to my right. So as uh, the director of, sorry, did I say the Clinton? <laughs> the Clinton Institute. So I thought you should have a question for me as director of the Mitchell Institute. So Mitchell and Clinton, as we know, have been <laughs> very responsible for some of the good fortune that we've enjoyed over the years. And my question relates to the very first statement uh, that you made when you began your lecture, which is that culture and emotion were the stuff that were particularly difficult in police transformation. Could you give us a couple of very specific examples of issues of culture and emotion that remain to be transformed in the police service? Um, well, I think that there is something around identity, uh, and this requires a huge balancing act and some of that wisdom that I was talking about earlier. So I, I try to, I've tried to depict over my five years who we are and what we're about by way of a, a, a triangle. Um, and at the top of the triangle, you've got the vision of what we're aspiring to, and then there's purpose and behaviours or values. We could have an academic discussion all day about whether they're behaviours or values and all of that. But the very base of the triangle, the broadest part of it, is who we are. We're the police service of Northern Ireland. Now, I know that that's sort of strikingly obvious and it's in statute and all the rest of it. But there is something about um, creating that balance of respecting the contribution that many police officers will have seen. This is talking about trying to deal with the culture issues internally, and you asked me what we're still grappling with. So you know, 20 years on after the creation of the PSNI, people will still talk their you know, stories of bravery and courage in a context sometimes of the Royal Ulster Constabulary, of which I was a very proud member. And I, you know, I don't question that heritage or anything like that. I'm proud to have done it. And I, you know, I, I, I carry many emotional scars from that time. But actually, that was then and this is now. And there is something around identity and giving people coming through the police service of Northern Ireland today confidence and pride in their identity as a police officer serving in this organization. And it's very interesting because um, around 80% uh, of the current police service were never in the RUC. But when you listen to the stories, when you see the photographs in the walls, when you hear the, the, the conversations in a police canteen, you'd think it was the opposite was true. Um, and I don't mean that all of that culture is bad, but it's more the positive of the here and now and trying to get people to have that confidence and that belief in who they are and to take pride in that identity. And I think you do it from actually confronting it. You have these sorts of conversations. We have, we've had a whole emerging leaders program, for example, and we deal with some of these cultural issues and we deal with, it's not a case that people aren't allowed to talk about the good old days. Of course, you know, we've all done that over a cup of tea or a fizzy orange or whatever, but it's, it's more about the progressive field going forward, about trying to make that into something. And that's just uh, one small example. I think there are, there are other things in the sort of business end of any big public sector organization that are just culturally really challenging. There is sometimes um, a bit of a, an entitlement syndrome that's because we've got quite generous uh, regulations and provisions around things like uh, absence pay through sickness. And of course, we want to be sympathetic to that and we want to be supportive of our staff. But actually, that's almost viewed as an entitlement rather than a facility to help people to get back to their public service life quicker and better. Um, and and a, lot of, a lot of that has got to do with actually just trying to balance the need for frank conversations along with the empathy and the sympathy bit to, to do that in a supportive way. And I think because it is less tangible and less likely to be explained, things like identity or uh, you know, a, a, an entitlement feeling, you're not going to deal with that by way of a flowchart or a policy document. It's into how people's, what people's values are, what makes them tick, and being able to gently and supportively challenge that. And, bring a different perspective to bear. OK, 
Okay, thank you, George. I'm going to take the last two questions and I'm going to run them together. So yourself in the black T-shirt in the centre here, and there's a chap in a tweed jacket at the back there. So black T-shirt first, then tweed jacket, and we'll run the two of them together. If you can keep them nice, tight, disciplined questions, no pressure. <laughs> thank you. Uh, Killian Thornton, um, I got asking this question to Stephen Martin and Mark Hamilton, and I got one good reply and one bad reply, so I'll not tell you which, which is which, but... Uh, my question revolves around um, of what you've thought, talked about uh, community representation and um, it's quite simple of how do you attract people like myself from Cross McGlennon and South Armagh, people from West Belfast, people from the bog side into the PSNI? Okay, Can you hold that one for response for a second George and yourself in the tweet jacket, yeah. As a mind reader at Loose, um, my name is Bob Collins. I'm former Chief Commissioner of the Equality Commission and a current member of the Policing Authority, but obviously I, in Ireland I represent nobody except myself. <clears throat> First, thank you very much for an open, frank, stimulating and ultimately encouraging uh, contribution uh, this evening. My question related also is a double-part question related to the issue of community representation and the, the, the as you identified, probable reduction in Catholic representation, underrepresentation of young people, women, uh, loyalist working class. What is the kind of conversation that you would like to see uh, on this issue of community representation to which you made reference? How do you think that might be framed? How do you think it might be shaped? And secondly, given the perfectly proper, very necessary fair employment legislation, how do you actually create a more representative, a more diverse police service? Okay, um, it sounds like an evening in itself, those two questions, but I'll have a go and hopefully I fall into whatever the right answer was that you heard from either <laughs> Stephen Martin or uh, Mark Hamilton. Um, but I think I sort of can answer the two in, in one go here because the first thing that I think that we need to do is uh, um, identify the blockers, the obstacles, to what is it that prevents a young person or even an older person from Cross McGlenn wanting a career in policing. Um, and when we identify those, we can only then start to do something about them. We commissioned a piece of independent research through Deloitte on barriers to recruitment. And that was significant. So there were lots of things that the organisation, the police service, needed to do that were barriers. We were really wanting to know about barriers to Catholic uh, recruitment uh, because of the underrepresentation and um, not being able to address that through sort of more conventional means. But actually, we found that the same, a lot of the same factors as they related to the police service related to all underrepresented groups, even people geographically underrepresented, like West of the Ban and all sorts of things. Um, but a lot of those were very transactional, um, sort of process-driven things. So it was things like uh, how we engage with people, how we make it attractive through social media, uh, where people have to go to follow all the various elements of the process. Do they have to go to a police establishment in their locality or can they go to a more neutral environment where they can be a little bit more anonymous to find out more to see if they actually want a career here. There was the ability to do a lot of the testing online for example that we've introduced as a result of that. There was a shortening of the process because not only from the Catholic community in particular, um, not only were the numbers of original applicants not as high as we would have hoped for but there was also uh, more likely that people's interest would fall away the longer the process went on. So we sort of have done all of that. And I'm not saying that there's no cultural obstacles within the police service. And I suppose every interaction that we have with a citizen or with a community has the potential to be either an obstacle or an enabler because people's views, perceptions will be formed through those experiences. And when you're an emergency responding organization that sometimes has to arrest people, uh, do unpopular things, follow the evidence, do the law enforcement bit of policing, sometimes that creates, but that should not be, and uh, you know, our Section 75 monitoring would tell us that that's no more likely to be in the Catholic community than the unions community. So, um, but 
there is something about those encounters, just making sure that they are quality so that people have the confidence in us, not just to believe in their police service, but where the circumstances are right for people to join us. So uh, a, lot of the, a lot of the obstacles that we have control over were quite transactional, albeit accepting this thing about every contact leaves a trace for good or bad and all of that. Um, but there are also a number of other factors that exist sort of outside of our control that require a change in societal thinking. Um, and that is impacts like far, far more than whether or not you had to go to a police station to sit an entrance exam or an aptitude test was yeah. things like how your family perceived a career in policing. Um, so uh, if the family were unenthusiastic or not advocates for a career in policing, then a person, especially a younger person, is much less likely to want to join. There's also, because of our legacy, you know, a very well-known Republican who I'll not mention, whenever I was having this discussion with him in a very open and constructive way, he said, you have to remember that within some Republican communities, we spent three generations telling people not to trust the police, not to join the police, not to go anywhere near the police. And then they buy into policing. And I have no doubt that, you know, apart from a very small rump of dissidents, the vast majority of people have crossed the Rubicon into a support for law and order, a support for policing. But it's like a final step and too far for some to actually move beyond that into advocating for a career in policing. And I think you're more likely, forgive my stereotyping, I don't know that I've got the evidence to say this, but I think it's worth a punt. Um, I think you're more likely to get that reluctance in uh, two groups, the broader Republican community and working class loyalist communities. So, um, you know, in, in many sort of middle class unionist communities, forgive the stereotyping, but I'm trying to make the point, you know, if you want to become a teacher, a doctor, a vicar, or a police officer, those are all good and honourable things to do. I was nearly saying a lawyer there, and then I thought, well, maybe not. <laughs> Steady on. <laughs> <laughs> but you, do you know what I mean? The sort of professions, semi-professions, are all good and honourable public services to do. Uh, my friend, this Republican, who was trying to get me to understand some of these obstacles within his community, would say that that's really unlikely to happen in many Republican families and communities. Now that's a major generalisation and please don't uh, anyone take offence at that but as a generalisation with that health wearing attached to it. Um, and I think you know needing to mobilise civic leadership and political leadership support for a career in policing and actually if there's things that aren't right that we still need to fix you need to tell us so we fix them so they're not obstacles to people wanting to join us. Uh, because I don't think you'll get a lot of resistance around that. I think there are other poisonous issues, like legacy, and I don't mean that if you're a suffering relative here tonight, by the way, but I'm talking about the, the, the toxic nature of the legacy issue that probably has more of a detrimental impact in the Catholic nationalist community than in other communities, predominantly the Protestant Unionist one. Um, and that's because of what we have seen around things that have gone wrong, people operating outside of the law, outside of regulation, context gets lost in the passage of time, and you can make excuses all day, but actually, I do think in a number of, you've mentioned Cross McLean, where you're from, I would have thought that uh, a number of the high profile legacy cases are probably not really an enabler to young nationalist Republicans wanting to join us. I'd love it not to be so, but I think that's probably a, a fact of, of life. Um, and there's been lots of controversy um, to around the 50-50 issue. The position that we have taken as an organisation, continue to take, is that strategically, at the time that it was introduced for that 10-year period, it was absolutely the right thing to do. It would have taken multiple generations, decades of policing, to get us to the 32% that we're at today, had 50-50 not been in place. It was the right thing to do, but fundamentally, it's a political decision. And I don't think it's one that we should be either advocating for or against, other than to acknowledge that it worked before, and actually, it's only one tool in the box. And I do think it's, there's a responsibility 
on everyone of influence to do what they can to make their police service representative. And that needs to start with realizing that we're not always going to get it right first time. It's not my fault uh, that we're stuck with the toxic legacy issues. That is me as chief or the organization. Um, and when we make mistakes, we're human beings, that's going to happen. And one bad experience is not a reason to write off a career option. I mean, I, sometimes I go to the doctor and I have to wait too long or they're a bit rude to me or they give me the wrong tablets or whatever. I don't like tell my daughter that she shouldn't become a doctor because I had a bad experience with a GP once. You know, that would be madness. And I'm just looking for the same generosity and grace from our political leadership around this. Okay. Folks, I think I'm going to uh, bring things to a close. Can I just, um, first of all, thank you all very much for coming out tonight. I know it was a rough night. If it's any consolation, the sun is now out. Um, secondly, so George is coming to the end of his uh, career in policing. He's only 52. Like It's not like you're going to sit back and put your feet up. But on a personal basis, um, I've shared a few platforms with George. And while we probably haven't agreed on legacy stuff um, all the way, I've always felt slightly sorry for your PR people or your lawyers. Because one of the nice qualities that you have is that you tend to answer as honestly as you can in your position. <laughs> and I think that's a quality in this place which can be quite unforgiving that people warm to you. So I think, would you all help um, join me and say good luck in your future? Thank you very much.